So I see many people connecting, it's great. And I hope everyone received all instructions. Um, I know that some people had some difficulties receiving uh, the instruction in spams and uh, uh, we are actually suffering from the, the success of this workshop. Uh, we started thinking it would be uh, 20, 30 people, and now we have more than 120 people interested to participate. I'm, I don't think everyone will participate, but at least many people express interest. So it means that wetlands is a really living ecosystem, uh, and also the, the wetlands community is very active. And we have many people that uh, excuse themselves of not being able to participate because they are either in some African mangroves or in some Brazilians uh, uh, um, Varzea and so but uh, all our wetlands colleagues uh, express interest uh, also from the in situ people that are a lot but they are as many people at the moment are on, on in field campaign what is good because after two years of COVID actually the wetlands community suffered a lot uh, uh, about in situ data, it was very hard to organize all this in situ measurement. So it's good to see that it's coming back to normal, uh, especially in these very, very remote places. So it's uh, already uh, one minute past our, our schedule. I would like to welcome everyone uh, to participate to this GeoWetland Initiative um, uh, virtual evaluation workshop. Our idea here is. Uh, um, um, at the moment uh, where we are discussing uh, our new 2023-2025 um, uh, geo work program and discussing implementation plan of, of geo activities to discuss what, how we could revive and what we should do to have more impact around this geo wetlands activity. And so we have here original members uh, of the string committee of the wetlands that I'd like to, to thank uh, for being here, such as Mark Paganini, uh, Hilda Rizlamert, and Adrian Strauch, as have done an amazing job to help us to um, uh, remind what was the wetlands at the, at the beginning and, and how we could uh, work with them to open it to the to larger community. Um, I would like to start with just uh, giving uh, a brief overview of the agenda for today. So we will start with uh, an introduction from Yana Gevorgian, uh, our Geosecretary Director that is with uh, us today. Thank you very much, Yana. Uh, we will then have uh, an overview of the uh, Geo Wetland uh, activity, uh, his historical achievement and, and also the gaps and uh, how we could actually make it evolve to a a new 2023, uh, 2025, uh, very active geo wetland activity. Then we will have some uh, presentation from our colleagues from uh, Ramsar, Maria Rivera, and Lisa Maribello from the Scientific and Technical Review Panel of Ramsar. I would like to thank very much Maria and Lisa for helping us to, to, to design uh, this workshop and to be very active so that we really can answer the Ramsar needs on wetlands. We will also have uh, colleagues from UNEP that are a co-custodian on the SDG 6.6.1 that will also uh, be present a bit later uh, today for this workshop. Then we'll have a short participant introduction and after that the rest of the meeting. It's not a symposium, um, it's really a, a, a brainstorm workshop. It means that we want to give more space as possible to discussion. So we ask people just to give very brief presentations so we know about, about them, we know about this program, but we will mainly focus on discussion. And we can, at any moment, kind of change the schedule depending on where the, the, the flows go. It's a very open meeting, so please be active. If you think we should go in another direction, you, we are here to hear you. It's a good moment to discuss it and so that we, we, we can um, um, uh, re revive this geo wetland activity. Workshop has to, uh, to create at the end a, group of lead, a new group of leadership with, let's say, a pre-steering committee that will prepare uh, the new implementation plan of the, the geo initiative. It means that this pre-steering committee doesn't have to engage for the 2023-2005 period, but just for the period until the geo week at the end of the year, November, to draw this new geo wetlands activity. We'll have then a mirror map brainstorm session. Uh, you will see we kind of prepare a game so that we facilitate the discussion and then a wrap up. But uh, without further ado, I'd like to, to give the voice to our director, Yana. Yana, please, uh, up to you. you. I know you have a lot of expectation mm -hmm. from uh, this geo activity and so I'm happy to give you the voice. 
Thanks, Lauren, and good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, where if you are where it's not morning. And I think I can just say um, this looks to be a meeting of a wetlands fan club. We're obviously <laughs> all uh, wetland groupies, and I'm really, really thrilled to be joining this fan club. So thanks for accepting our invitation and being on this call. Um, Lohan did, a, I think, really good job in the document that he shared with you, articulating sort of the reason why we wanted to do this, because it's not, I, I'm not here to tell anyone about how fantastic and important wetlands are and what essentially services they provide to our economy, people, our livelihoods. Um, we obviously all know that. But why, uh, what's really driving the moment for us is, as Laurent said, we are currently in GEO putting a lot of emphasis on the delivery of results to the countries to fulfill their responsibilities under various treaties and conventions, but also to really effectively plan, manage, conserve, restore um, their vital um, ecosystems and habitats. And so responding to sort of the signals on the political landscape, um, nature-based solutions have entered for the mainstream discourse everywhere and wetlands constitute such an essential part of nature-based solutions. It really made sense that we would identify this area as the need for us to revive the activity, but do it a bit differently and really bring about this global coordination among the most important biggest players in this space whom you all represent. Um, you know, there's no lack of products coming online, obviously. Um, and our motivation here in GEO is to help the countries not to have to sieve through and figure out which products are actually fit for purpose, which they ought to be using and how they ought to be using, but really use our mandate as the global coordination mechanism for earth observation and do that coordination part on behalf of the convention, on behalf of those entities who really work at the country level so that they have the curated, if you will, methods and approaches and products available to them. Um, ultimately, what's driving our intention is to work with the right parties to help reach that last mile, um, offer a delivery of capacities or sharing to countries, um, and in the grand scheme, accelerate sort of adoption of nature-based solutions, nature-positive policies um, at country level, as well as really going beyond just the national sort of decision-making, but also informing investments that are being made uh, by the finance sector and businesses um, in, in various activities that obviously do need to be cognizant of what those investments are actually driving. So that's really our motivation. So, and that's why GEO is stepping in. Why now is because as Laurent said, we're in the process of developing our uh, last installment of our 10 year sort of uh, work program. And this is where we're putting our best power into this final program because we have learned a ton through our activities of coordinating forest uh, monitoring at global scale, biodiversity monitoring at global scale, working with partners across the globe on this. We've learned a ton. We've learned so much about really where we need to put emphasis in ensuring this coordination and a sort of fit for purpose delivery of uh, products and knowledge. And so this is really uh, the time for us to leverage the wisdom. You know, if we're thinking of that pyramid from data products, knowledge and wisdom, I think we're kind of climbing up towards the wisdom part there. And so we feel this is our time to sort of apply that wisdom and really make this um, a stupendous activity that will just stand on the shoulders of the giants, the organizations that you represent, with the ultimate vision of really making the task for countries um, to access this data products a lot easier. So um, our implementation plan is a really provides a really effective roadmap um, because it makes us think about all the steps in the value chain 
all the way towards the impact and about who the essential partner organizations ought to be and what's the operating space for us and what we ought to be thinking about collectively. So I hope this um, energy only increases as we go through the next um, two hours. Um, and at the end of uh, tomorrow, I really hope that we have the essential sort of kernel of the next um, geo flagship in place and that we can um, develop over the course of the next few years. So Laurent, thanks for giving me a chance to share why I'm so psyched and excited about this activity. And I turn this over um, to you. Thank you so much, uh, Jana, to share this excitement. I think we're all excited here and we understand about the ambition and the moments that we are living. So without waiting more, I'd like to uh, ask our uh, Geo Wetlands historical colleagues, uh, and I'd like Adrian to, to, I think it's Adrian, if I remember well, that will uh, present this morning. And yes. also remembering that we will have uh, two sessions today will be the same session, but with people from different parts of the globe, and it will be a repetitive session, but everyone is, is invited to participate to any session. So please, uh, our Joe Wetlands colleagues, please present. Uh, um, yeah, I think you can share your screen. Yeah, perfect. I hope you see it already. Does yeah, it Adrian, perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, welcome everyone also from my side, from our side as the um, Geo Wetlands team, let's say. So, I mean, many of you here already know about Geo Wetlands, I think, and several people here already have been involved. So um, this presentation is just meant to quickly give an overview of, yeah, more or less the history of Geo Wetlands and also try to, to draw a picture of the current statues and then a brief yeah, vision, let's call it what we would envision for Geo Wetlands for the future. So, um, yeah, just on the history. So basically, I think at least since 2007, there is this idea of a, of a global wetland observation system or observing system, which has been discussed within the framework of the Ramsar Convention. And then as far as I know, since 2011, this already came into contact to GEO by yeah, ha having it as, at least partly covered by GEO Bonn or addressed by, by GEO Bonn to, to look into how this could be achieved and supported. And um, yeah, in this time frame, also after 2011, there were several workshops and activities going on. That's actually also how I came into contact with this whole idea and activity. And so, yeah, at one point then the, we had this situation that there were several projects involved in parts of realizing something like this. So there were the Globe Wetland projects by ESA, also the Global Mangrove Watch activity by JAXA. Then we had this um, Euro European, quite big European project, the Satellite-Based Wetland Observation Service and some other, I mean, Globe Wetland Africa is also in this Globe Wetland um, project stream which were yeah several of them were running at the same time and we really thought that's a nice opportunity to work together and to see how we could really move into realizing such a global system and that's also when the idea was born to to move this whole activity to a next level let's say and and yeah prepare a plan for a really wetland focused geo initiative and that's yeah why we got together and developed such an implementation plan in 2016 and suggested this as a new geo activity and yeah we were successful with that and then we had a few years of really strong activity mainly as already said driven by these different projects and the project activities and the um and the um yeah, implementation plan that was developed around these um, project outcomes, etc. But yeah, then moving already a bit more to towards the current statues, then after many of these projects ended, we really realized and be, yeah, got to feel that this project focus really was not the best way of moving this activity into the future of continuing efforts and of even uh, increasing, um, for example, the, the global yeah the global participation in this whole activity etc so we we realized that there are some some issues and that led in a way to the fact that geo wetlands was in a kind of hibernation stage for the last few years i mean we are still there we are still ambitious to continue with this but we were in kind of a position where we yeah didn't have a clear idea how to continue where to get the resources and i think that's why it's really nice to have this opportunity now to work closely with the geo secretariat to to look into this and that's also from my point of view one of the key aspects of this workshop today so um just to give an overview of what geo wetlands 
is or what our um, I mean what the implementation plan and everything um, entailed so far so the mission for geo wetlands we, we always defined as kind of to develop sustained global earth observation approaches to wetland inventory mapping monitoring and assessment which is quite in line I think with many of the needs of, of global stakeholders like I would see as the main stakeholders I would see the Ramsar Convention of course but also UN Environment Program but there are also others on the global level that also Jana already pointed to I mean, wetlands play an important role in, in many of these global um, policy frameworks. And so as some objectives we wanted to really um, tackle with this activity was to, on the one hand, to really build a collaborative global framework for, for um, yeah, working on these wetland aspects. So to really build an environment that can allow everyone to participate and to work together to co-design such a global wetland observation system, which was already mentioned. So that's definitely one of the key aspects of this whole activity to, to develop such a system that's useful for, for many different stakeholders. And also to, to build a community of practice for wetland mapping and monitoring. So to really work with everyone who is working in this field, to bring them together, to bring together the earth observation experts with the uh, wetland experts. So that was or always one of our key ideas to really yeah bring together these two different communities and also to build on existing efforts so and partnerships so it was never our goal to build something completely new to um yeah let's say to build some competition to anyone but just to to build on existing things and to, to bring things together and to coordinate how to make the best use of earth observation um approaches for supporting this these already existing communities and as i said that was supported by different projects and initiatives and so we really yeah try to move forward on that by initiating um the geo wetlands initiative but um yeah as mentioned um there were also some challenges we we had to approach which i will get to in a minute but um yeah, here is just an overview of what we envisioned as kind of the target audience or audiences for for this activity. And so, as you can see, it's quite a diverse field. So, I mean, we have on the global level, I already mentioned these um, international conventions and other global um, partnerships, frameworks that would really benefit by having good and easy access to global statistics, indicators, and also global maps and other products. But then, of course, a, a very important um, stakeholder is, is the national level and maybe also regional initiatives. So really to look into what do countries need with regards to, to wetland inventories, to um, national statistics, indicators, and regarding methods, and also guidance on how to use um, different existing methods. So how can, um, how can yeah, these national agencies and other players really benefit from, from Earth observation. And yeah, this even goes down to the local level where it's more like wetland managers, NGOs, and um, other wetland practitioners. Um, yeah, that could also, of course, benefit from, from such um, yeah, developed methods and products. And yeah, so I already mentioned some challenges, but also maybe ideas we had. So our goal was always to really open up this um, initiative to make, to let it grow and to have an active community. And our vision regarding the um, the steering of this um, initiative was always to develop a rather yeah inclusive um, open structure. So we, our idea was to develop a kind of secretariat which until now was always uh, working in a virtual way. So we had the kind of virtual um, secretariat where several people and organizations like Mark Paganini from ESA, Lammert Hilaridis from Wetlands International and me, but also some others were quite active to try and move this forward. And then the idea was to have this community of practice that would really yeah, support many of the different activities and also maybe to establish an advisory board where these important um, global but also other stakeholders would yeah, be involved and in, in direct exchange with the activities and um, yeah so this in our vision also entailed some parts of uh, more top-down activities like the secretariat would give some important um, steering and guidance regarding producing the important outputs like yeah writing 
reports and project proposals, but also developing methodological guidelines, etc. So this would be more done in a top down coordinated way while the community of practice was more thought in a way of um, bottom up um, initiatives activities supporting the overall geo wetlands um, goals and missions but but yeah really community driven activities that could support either specific wetland type activities like activities on mangroves or specific parts of the um, geo wetlands um, implementation plan like focusing on capacity building for example or on on development of, of the portal of these um, more IT tools, let's say. And yeah, but as I said, we had this strong project focus and that quite um, quickly led to the fact that we simply were yeah, lacking the resources and the manpower and everything to really um, move all of this into an operational and um, continuous effort and to have continuous management and communication capacities to keep this alive and to even yeah, evolve it to grow it into something um, bigger and really including all the important um, yeah, parties on the global scale, let's say. So that's, I think, one of the main reasons why it, um, after the end of these different projects, um, yeah, trickled down to only a, yeah, an activity on a very small flame, let's say. We, it's still alive, it's still there, but it's, yeah, it's not, it doesn't have the scope we would like it to have and also not the scope that Jana just mentioned as, as, as a goal for the coming years, let's say. Yeah, so I think that's um, on this part and now just to briefly show what still already has been achieved. So, I mean, we, Geo Wetlands, as I said, it's still there. So we have this um, idea to really develop a wetlands, Geo Wetlands toolkit, which is in line with some of the geo strategies also already ongoing in other fields. So to, um, to move into an activity where we have such a toolkit that can really support all these stakeholders just mentioned. And some parts of that at least have been developed in a kind of pilot stage or demonstrated. I mean, there is a Geo Wetlands um, website, a knowledge base, which is which is online, which is working, but it's yeah, it's it's more in a pilot stage. So it's not really an operational platform right now, I would say. It's lacking content and it's also lacking, let's say, continuous um, management and etc. And there is a prototype portal, but that's also at the moment not really fully functional any longer because it was based on project activities, as said. So there's at the moment no one really able to continue to continue the development and to keep it really up to date, etc. So that's the stage on, on, on this side. Then, of course, there have also been many different projects and other activities that provide different toolboxes, tool sets, methods and yeah there are different guidelines etc available that that are already part of this toolkit or at least are connected to it there are these global important global data sets like global surface water explorer or global mangrove watch as examples which are already existing and which play an important role in this wetland context so these are all different existing components that could become a part of such a toolkit but at the moment they are i mean they are there they are usable but they are not really framed in a in a way that they really are different components of one standardized and easily accessible usable toolkit let's say and in a way that would be at least one of our visions for geo wetlands to provide such a toolkit in an, in a way that's very easy for people to use to see how they can use it for their own work make it um, useful for them and really fulfill this on different levels so of course on the data and map mapping aspects regarding analytics and statistics yeah but also looking more into education capacity building aspects so making available different training materials and support for the different types of stakeholders for different um, different geographic scopes etc and then yeah also have, have have it simply as a repository for case studies articles reports etc that are relevant and then maybe also yeah even move into the field of communication and cooperation so it provide maybe some interactive platform that really allows this whole community to engage more closely with each other to work together and communicate um yeah so in a way that's what we at least one aspect what we would see as as an, an quite important and nice way into the future 
but the question is what's really needed for that and what do we need now and how can we really move in that direction and i think that's also what this uh, workshop today is, is mainly for so i think um it was already mentioned um, that the next goal would be to develop a new and updated implementation plan. So that's really important that we look into what do we geo wetlands really want to be for the coming years. How can we move it into a yeah into such a new scope and um, revive it in a way and in, in a in a better way than it worked so far. I think we need active management and coordination for achieving that, and also more global participation collaboration. And yeah, in, in the end, I mean, it's always important to have the resources for really achieving the set um, objectives and deliverables. So I think that's also an important um, aspect that we at least should start to discuss today. And yeah, finally, to end this, I think it's really important. What we need is, is your ideas, inputs, participation and contribution. So really to work together and make this a community effort to, to move this on into a new um, level of activity, I would say. So that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian, for uh, sharing this vision uh, and opening to our geo community. I think it's a really good moment, uh, as everybody understands, uh, to do this meeting. Um, can you please stop to share your screen? I, we've seen a, a drawing, so I will try to share my screen to see maybe if I, I think it stopped now. All right, very good. So without waiting anymore, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Maya Rivera from um, the Ramsar Convention Secretariat uh, to present the importance of national wetlands inventories to report on SDGs. Please, Maria, can you share your thank screen? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Give me, give me a second. Okay, so good morning or good evening, wherever you are around the world in Ferdistan. I would like to thank the Geo Secretariat for reaching out to the Ransar Convention on Wetland Secretariat um, to, to try to move forward this process, this initiative. We are uh, very happy and very pleased uh, with this process. It's very timing in the different process that we have under, under the convention. I will uh, present a, a really brief overview of what we are doing according to our uh, the contracting parties mandate on the issue, on the um, themes of uh, wetland inventories, sustainable development goals, and reporting on wetland STEM. So I am senior advisor in the in the secretariat dealing with uh, different matters. I lead in the secretariat the process of SDGs and uh, national wetland uh, inventories um, among <laughs> other things. We are a very small uh, secretariat so with many hats. Um, so basically uh, regarding um, uh, national wetland inventory. Since uh, 1980, the Convention on Wetland has recognized the importance of national wetland inventories as a key tool for informing national policies and other measures to achieve conser uh, conservation and wide use of wetlands. So many of you that are in this uh, participating today are very aware of that. And there are many partners, JAXA, ESA, that know very well uh, um, our, the work of, of the convention. Also, um, um, the issue of, of the theme of wetland inventory has always been since the first strategic plan on, on the convention and is in the current one under ta target eight. Also, contracting parties have given, let's say, a renew, a renew uh, efforts uh, and importance on this, on this, on this matter for this triennial that we are that we are closing. So, all of efforts uh, we are putting to support contracting parties in completing and keeping up to date the national wetland inventories. Also, it's uh, in, the, in the global wetland outlook that was launched, launching for the first time in 2018. There is very clear the need to have accurate and more quality data regarding national wetland inventories. So also this, uh, the decision from contracting parties um, to do prioritization of inventories is related as well to the commitment that they made in, the, in, the, in their national reports, as I said, because it is reflecting, is how it is reflected and measure the progress of the strategic plan of the convention. So they also made as well the commitment to report on wetland stain using as a main source of information, the national wetland in, uh, inventories. So there is a concrete indicator that is the same, indicate under goals, a sustainable development goal six indicator is one, is part of the national of the national report of contracting parties to the convention. Also the other element is that the secretariat uh, and the convention, uh, along with the United Nations environmental programs, we are co-custodian of indicator six is one, that is the change in the stand of water related ecosystem over time. So 
there are two stream, stream lines of reporting, one that comes for UNEP and the other one that comes directly from the, from, from the convention according to the convention requirements, where it is reflected on how parties report in the national reports to the convention. Also, uh, measuring uh, on wetland stem, for example, is contributing to the global biodiversity framework that is being developed. So now this indicator 6 is 1 because of efforts of the secretariat and parties is now being proposed as a headline indicator for the, uh, for the strategic framework of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Also it has been included in the monitoring framework of the UN decade on, uh, on restoration, as, as long as three more uh, um, indicators coming from national, from national reports. So how party report and what is uh, the, the, the main, uh, very, very briefly, the main elements uh, that party use for reporting, of course, you know, or that we have under the convention uh, wetland definition. So it is the one that is used, of course, for this, for this pur purpose. Also, we use the Ransar classification system for wetland types. That is an international applicable habitat description that was adopted by contracting parties in the 90s, 90. And contracting parties report in three main categories. That is marine and coastal, inland and human made wetlands. So this is how they report to indicator 6 is 1. But of course, for the, for the UN statistical division, for this purpose, we only report the data on, because it's the fresh water. So we report only in inland and human-made wetlands. But of course, we keep the data as well for marine and, and coastal. So what is the status, the current uh, status? As you can see, uh, regarding national wetland inventories, 44% of the contracting parties have completed a national wetland, uh, a national wetland uh, inventory. So no other impor important progress, uh, 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 steps for parties uh, to, uh, uh, to complete. So these data are coming from the national reports to COP13. We will present a new uh, global implementation report and we will see what is the status on this area to COP14 uh, in November uh, this year. So just to, uh, just to close and like a kind of summary. So basically we have the mandate from contracting parties as being a co-custodian for indicator 61 to track the global, uh, global wetland status and trends. With, uh, which help to measure progress toward SDG 6 and indicator 6 is 1. Because of that, of course, we have the mandate uh, since past year uh, to support contracting parties uh, in how to complete and report on wetland stand. And we developed and launched a new toolkit for national wetland inventories in, 20, in 2020. And basically, uh, you know that all the guidance that is produced on this matter has been for many years under the convention produced by our scientific and technical uh, review panel. So what we did is to discuss with parties, to make a survey, to understand what are the, the, the gaps and needs and challenges that they had uh, regarding wetland inventories. And we took on consideration all these elements to, to repackage uh, all, the, all the guidelines that we have in, on, on wetland inventories. And as I said, we launched it in 2020. We also uh, uh, starting the process of strengthening capacity. So we provide uh, capacity building for contracting parties as well in 2020 with the support of different experts, including our main expert on wetland inventories from the, from the STRP, but also one of our key partners that is ISA that was as well uh, invited uh, to support uh, in, in the first training that that we have. Uh, we also work come together uh, with, uh, with UNEP and work together with UNEP in the preparation of joint storylines of indicator 61 that, uh, that are uh, used for the UN Secretary General Report at the high level uh, political forum. So we do this together uh, every year. And of course, we are, uh, we are in the process of signing a new MOU, but also we are, of course, discussing any, uh, some other uh, uh, areas or working, uh, or working together. So this is the basically the plan that, that we have at the moment. So we'll continue according to parties mandate to supporting contracting parties. We are in the process to develop, uh, um, to have a micro site inside our website with all the information regarding SDGs, with all the data that parties has provided so far that we, of course, have, uh, have uh, provided this information uh, uh, for SDGs. Um, uh, and in particular, SDG 6 is one. Uh, and also we have created since 2020 a help uh, desk to support contracting, contracting parties. And we are we will start uh, more or less middle of, of July this year based on all the gap analysis and all the 
um, surveys that we did uh, to support the 39 contracting parties that we are clear that do not have yet undertaken national wetland inventory. So that is in brief what we are what we are doing, and we have complemented this presentation with a, one of our uh, the vice chair of, of the our scientific and technical review panel that we will talk more. On the, on the work that has been done complementary regarding aid observation and, and the use for the convention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, for uh, a very clear and uh, didactic presentation of, of where we are uh, from uh, uh, the Ramsar Secretariat. Uh, we will continue um, with Lisa Maria Bello, that is vice chair of the Ramsar Scientific and Technical Review Panel, and that will uh, present uh, how our observation can support wetland inventory, monitoring, and assessment. Thank you very much, uh, Laurent, and thank you, Maria, um, for the introduction. So, as Maria said, and Laurent, I am here as Vice Chair to Ramsar Scientific and Technical Review Panel, but also as Principal Researcher in Earth Observation with the International Water Management Institute. And I just want to revisit very briefly in the next five, uh, seven minutes, um, what is needed from a geo wetlands um, in terms of what the STRP sees as focus areas and priorities, and how the geo work plan and a geo initiative can inter intersect. Um, with the Ramsar STRP work plan. So, sorry, see, there we go. So we're all aware that uh, wetlands are vital, eco vital ecosystems and um, healthy and functioning wetlands are really critical to human livelihoods and to sustainable developments. And yet the flagship publication of the Ramsar STRP, the Global Wetland Outlook, shows that up to 87% of global wetland resources have been lost and that wetland species continue to decline. And we're all well aware that there are multiple pressures on wetlands. And we've recently released an update uh, to that outlook uh, this year, which shows that unfortunately the situation continues to decline. So despite the work that we've done in this area, all of the great contributions um, to taking step forward to improve national wetland inventories, it really, uh, the work highlights that the urgency with which uh, wetlands need to be monitored um, and the information we need to provide Provide, um, cannot really, it cannot be underestimated and the critical uh, nature of this in a timely manner um, continues to be pressing. So this urgency is reflected um, in various policy uh, agenda. So wetlands are immediately important to several SDGs and we heard from Maria about uh, reporting on wetland extent and, and the Ramsar reporting and indirectly to many more SDGs as well. National wetlands uh, inventories are used to track 6.6.1, uh, the extent of water-related ecosystems, and earth observation data are also used as input, but there's a lot more potential here. In terms of the relevance for the global biodiversity goals and nature, 40% of all species live or breed in wetlands, and the negative trends in biodiversity and ecosystem functions are projected to continue or to worsen, and targets of no, not, no net loss really cannot be achieved without a better improved understanding and monitoring of wetlands, and also of restoring those which have been uh, degraded. More recently, uh, under the Glasgow Pact and for global climate um, agreements, many types of wetlands, but in particular peatlands, blue carbon ecosystems are exceptionally important in mitigation. Freshwater wetlands are crucial for the water cycle and maintaining water security, buffering extremes. And wetlands thus have the potential to contribute to both mitigation and adaptation targets. We also heard um, from Rihanna earlier the importance of, of, of MBS for climate change with far reaching benefits for, for nature and people and the role of wetlands within these. So wetlands are nature based solutions, they can contribute to nationally determined contributions and national action plans, but really in order to do this, we need to move forward the data that we can provide on wetland characteristics wetland extent and monitoring. So within this and addressing these goals, science and technology are really critical. Wetlands are typically inaccessible, as we know, they cover large areas. Many wetlands are seasonally, spatially dynamic. They're thus very well suited to the use of earth observation. We have a very solid foundation to build on here. We've got many existing examples, pilot demonstrations, a few global products for individual wetland types, toolkits and, and knowledge products as, Lamont, uh, sorry, as Adrian uh, showed us um, earlier. And of course, Geo Wetlands, which provides um, the platform and the knowledge base collecting repository for these. 
we've also demonstrated through the scientific and technical review panel, this publication on the right, and how we can better use earth observation for wetland inventory assessment and monitoring. But we still have much to do, and really um, this community that we're bringing together here has a huge role to play in this. What we're looking towards is how do we move, um, move from the individual pilot examples to operational large-scale approaches, global outputs. How can we look at better integration across thematic areas, across the different initiatives, and how can we focus on co-creation, so end-user-oriented data sets and tools and services which really address the critical needs and the gaps of our end users. From the, uh, the STRP process um, and with the Ramsar Convention, it really pro provides a platform like no other to foster the collaboration and partnership to support other international policy mechanisms and to support the use of the best available data, advice and policy recommendations to enable national governments to realize the benefits of fully functional wetlands. And so in terms of alignments um, and the production uh, of products, integration um, with, with national inventories, um, we're in the process at the moment where we've just completed uh, recommendations of work areas and priorities which have been submitted and will be addressed uh, by the next standing committee in a couple of weeks time, at the end of May, and which will prepare matters uh, for decision by the next COP. And so the STRP recognizes as high priority the need to prepare guidance on inventories and monitoring of small wetlands, as well as others, their multiple values uh, for biodiversity conservation, especially in the context of uh, land management and climate change. And really, I just want to emphasize that um, while we've made great strides in addressing wetland extent and SDG 6.6.1, there's much more that we can do here with the help of the, the EO community, because really we need to go beyond just extent to look at um, habitat, habitat type and condition, ecological character. And these are areas which really require development of approaches. And so just a few concluding remarks. There's really an opportunity here. Support is needed from the geo community, from the EO community. And monitoring of wetlands is crucial, but it's not yet good enough. So even basic information baselines are often weak. The national wetland inventories are important in planning and decision support at the national level, but they still need to be strengthened. And while they're also critical for each of the uh, the global policy processes that I mentioned briefly and what and wetland extent is a key indicator, we really need inventories to start uh, to move beyond these to include also state and approaches for this required development. Integrating wetlands at the national level into NDCs offers a way for countries to achieve more ambitious climate plans and where this is a gap where we really need, we have a chance here to provide the information in particular over the next 10 to 12 months as NDCs uh, will be updated. So I'm going to stop there. I'm really looking forward to the discussions later today. Thank you very much and looking forward to the input. Thank you very much, Lisa, for this great presentation. And, and I think really it's in line with uh, Jana um, was uh, discussing about this integrated view because in your presentation, you, you didn't limit it to actually actually the mission of the Ramsar circuit, but also with a broader vision about climate issue, nature-based solution, biodiversity. I mean, it's, it's, it's really good to have because it is and also our Earth observation can go much more than just looking at, uh, at uh, wetlands extent. And I think this will be very important for our discussion on how we can organize ourselves to deliver more, deliver more and, 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 and in, uh, um, on, on which issues. So thank you so much. Uh, we, are, we are very good also. Thanks for respecting time. We are ahead of time. So that's, that's re also really good. We'll have more time for discussions. Um, our next, next step will be to have a, a, a little break for participants' introductions. So our colleagues, Sam and Julie, will share a survey so that everyone can actually uh, say who they are, why, why they are here, what are the, their main position, also linked to wetlands, and also what type of wetlands actually they are uh, acting on. Uh, it can, it will, we will use actually the, the Ramsar um, um, classification of wetlands and, and we will share it. I, will, I would like before, before that also to welcome Stuart Crane from UNEP, uh, being a, a co question uh, of 6.6.1. We had difficulties to include Stuart because of email issues. We didn't have the good email. Sorry for that, Stuart, but good you are here today. I hope you are. Uh, 
uh, hearing us. Um, and if you want to say one word before we go to this more broader participant introduction, uh, please do so. Yeah, I see you on screen. Can you say some words, sir? Thank you. Many thanks, Laurent, and um, and very nice to meet you, Laurent, and uh, and um, all the colleagues joining. Uh, my name is Stuart Crane. I work with the United Nations Environment Program, and um, it's great to be joining this uh, this call. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased, although uh, I, I, I'm joined a little late, um, that UDEP can be part of this these discussions. Um, as many of you um, will know, that you know part of the co-custodian of Indicator 661 and and, um, and my role within UNIP has, has been to, to lead that development of, of supporting countries with monitoring water-related ecosystems. Um, and I work within the Freshwater Ecosystem Unit of, uh, of UNIP to do that. So it's, um, that's a very swift introduction, just to say that I'm very happy to be part of this conversation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Stuart, and we will surely include you in this discussion. So please uh, stay with us, be active. I mean, it's really, uh, as you as you understood, it's really a brainstorm meeting. So it's it's nothing started yet. It's just we just started the discussion, uh, set the floor, and and now. So I don't know if Julie and Sam are with us to actually share this survey. If we can, uh, if you actually can uh, launch it and put it on screen. Uh, yeah, they sent a link. So actually, it will go this way. Thanks, Julie, for sharing. So in the chat, uh, you have a, a link. Uh, and and please uh, uh, just go on it. I will share my screen so that you can see what it is about. And everybody is invited to uh, fill this uh, survey up. As you can see, I will do it. And you can do it on, on your own computer. And if you have any question about how to do it, please uh, put it into the chat and uh, Julie and Sam will, will answer you. Thank you. Um, all right, Julie and Sam, we are waiting for you. I think you could start to share the results. The other can finish, but so that we can have, a, if it's possible, can you uh, share some results about this survey? Uh, uh, yes. yes, yes. Hi, everybody. Already. Um, so I'm Julie from the Geosecretariat, and uh, I'm very happy to be able to be here with you and to participate in this event. So we can already share with you some results. So here we are, we have now uh, 27 answers. Um, so the first one is the name, so, so we can see that the answers keep keep coming. So I think it will be updated uh, on in live. Um, we have here the emails, institutions. So we have more people that come from other kinds of institutions, but a lot of the academia and research um, domain. Also, a little bit of private and uh, NGOs and government. We have also some graphs. And here for the, the regions, we see that there are three people coming from South Africa, but it's very diverse. And we have really people coming from all over the world. So that's uh, very interesting to see that this whole community is bringing together for this event. Concerning the uh, region of focus of the, the, the work, it's more global, but we have more also, we can see in Africa, uh, America, but also we can see that this, this is very diverse and it concerns the whole world. And here maybe we have some graph more. It's, it's also very distributed between the three, three types of wetlands. So there is a little bit more of inland wetlands, but we see that the three of them are represented. And here the graph that is also being updated on la in life for the marine, marine uh, coastal wetlands, but we have also for inland wetlands and the human-made wetlands. I don't know if you uh, would like to see one or two in particular, or someone want to bring up its participation or its experience. Actually, that's really good. Thank you. I mean, what is impressive is we see that all type of wetlands with mm -hmm. somebody that is know something about it, what is good for the discussion. Uh, if we had were missing, some of them would be would be more difficult. But we can see that uh, just for this first, uh, uh, and it will be you know the same workshop in two sessions. So we will have compliments from the second group. So thanks everyone for 
I was surprised because I, I've seen a lot of, I so saw I see that South Africa kind of won the battle here. <laughs> it's not a battle at all, but just just a joke. We've seen that South Africa, I, I don't know if the name is uh, because of the number of people that answered, is it this or it's just, um, I'm very pleased to see so many, so many friends from South Africa. Yes. I didn't see our friend of China. I hope they didn't have any difficulty to, to fill this form because I know they are very present here. If they have any difficulty and they want to share it in another way, uh, please do so. Um, um, you can, uh, we can send you directly the, the, the questionnaire so to be sure that you are well represented uh, um, uh, in, this, uh, in this survey. Thank you, Julie and Sam, for, for organizing this. I think it's, it gives us a good uh, um, uh, introduction to, to now start the brainstorm to kind of see who is who. Um, I will now, if you can stop to share your screen, I will share mine as we will now uh, uh, start uh, uh, um, this session about wet sense monitoring uh, program and, and, and projects. I need to share my screen here. All right. Thanks so much, Julie. It was great. Um, so, uh, Stephen and Mark, hope you are well and you are here. Uh, we will give you the, the floor to you for the, the next session. Um, and uh, uh, I will let uh, uh, um, Stephen introduce the session uh, with Mark. Please, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Um, Mark, do you want to do your quick intro? I need to unmute myself. I was not really planning, let's say, to, um, to, to introduce it. But maybe I can say something very quickly. There's one thing that uh, Jana said that probably didn't really um, yeah, ring the bell to you is, is to, to raise geo wetlands to the level of a flagship. And um, there are two conditions, let's say. A flagship is really the top level of, uh, of a work program activities within GEO. And I'm sure that Tiana or, the, or somebody from GeoSex knows it much better than me. But if I summarize the three conditions that we need to have a flagship is a community engagement. And I'm really impressed by, by what we have today. It's much more, I must say, than what we, we managed to do with, with Lambert and Adrian during the, 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 last few, uh, the last few years. It doesn't mean that all of you will be actively involved, but at least it shows a very strong interest, let's say, in this initiative. And if you want to reach the level of a flagship, we need to have a very strong engagement an active participation from all of you. So I'm really, really glad to have this. Another uh, condition is to be strongly connected to the, to the policy uh, stakeholders. And here, having uh, the Ramsar Convention uh, and the Secretariat um, uh, that express the interest, let's say, to be part of the Geo Wetland Initiative in the same way as Stuart and, and UNEP, but there are probably other ones, huh? I think other, other uh, policy frameworks were mentioned during this, uh, this, this introduction. So maybe we could also try to see if we should involve them some ways in some steering or advisory uh, community. But it's very important that whatever we do is fully anchored into, in, into the policy framework. And this is what, what I got from these introductions. Huh? And what in a way that we didn't fully achieve, even if we involve uh, Ramsar from the very beginning in the Geo Wetland Initiative. And, and the last one is to have the resources and the governance structure that allows us to deliver. Because what is important is at the end of the day, we deliver to, uh, to, to, to the Ramsar stake, uh, sorry, to, the, to the wetland stakeholders, to the wetland community at board. So if we have the three elements, the engagement, the, the, the delivery, and, 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 and the resources to deliver, and, and, and the strong connection to the, to the policy uh, frameworks, I think we can say that we are a flagship of, um, of GEO. So this is what I wanted to, to really, um, let's say, uh, uh, yeah, put forward in, in our discussions for, for, the next, uh, for the next part of the discussion today. Uh, and we are going now to listen, because what is important is that we, we need to have a number of, uh, of uh, contributors to the, we need to build on existing projects, on existing ex initiative, on existing activities. And that's what we are going to hear now from, uh, from various, uh, uh, various activities, uh, I, I will not call them projects. In some cases, they are projects, so they have a fixed duration. In other, in other cases, they are more long-term type of activities that they have their own existence, let's say. Huh? Uh, and this is what we want to hear from them. And what we want to hear from them is also what they see as a need 
uh, and what EO can, can contribute, let's say, from, uh, from to, to what we heard from, uh, from the introduction of, uh, of Lisa and, um, and Marta. So this is what I wanted to say. So I was a bit improvised. I was not really planning to say this, but I hope that uh, I pass the message to all of you. Th thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, I think, I think that was really useful in those three points. And also, um, you know, we, we have a lot of people talking about nature-based solutions across geo at large, so it all, it all fits really well. Um, so the goal of this session is to present uh, existing, let's call them programs, based on what Mark just said, um, that deliver EO products for wetlands monitoring, inventory and assessment. So lots of stuff that we've already heard about this morning. Um, it's a list of existing international and regional programs that was already shared with us and updated by some of the participants. So thanks to those participants who did that. Um, and with a few exceptions uh, of some national monitoring platforms that are not listed uh, right now. So these, these um, programs that will be presented now and this afternoon um, have a focus on products that are being delivered. And in, uh, on the second day, there'll be another session on the way the products are being uh, distributed. Uh, following these presentations, we'll have a short Q&A and a discussion on how the existing monitoring programmes contribute to the needs and possible objectives of geo-wetlands. And there will be a brainstorm session called a Miro um, to link up with the, the needs of existing products from the ongoing programs and also to identify gaps. And so this will help us define the requirements of the new or the, 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 the geo wetlands activity that Adrian gave a nice overview of. So um, I don't think there's anything else I need to do apart from uh, hand over to Ake Rosenquist uh, and Ake will talk about Global Mangrove Watch. Yep. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I'll share my screen and see if I can um, get this going. So uh, I just have four slides on the Global Mangrove Watch. It's, uh, uh, it's a project that's been kind of in the kind of ongoing and then it was established actually more than 10 years ago in 2011 when we kind of launched it. Um, then kind of uh, it was part of a um, of the JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency uh, Kyoto Carbon Initiative, which was an initiative that we launched to try to use um, uh, or demonstrate how Earth observation data could be used to support uh, climate, carbon, uh, um, environmental conventions. Um, and uh, it has since then grown into a, a rather large project. So I'd like just like to, to acknowledge my co-authors here, uh, Pete Bunting and uh, Richard Lucas from Everest University and Lamert uh, Hilaridis, who is here from Wetlands International, Lisa Maria Ribello, and then uh, Nathan Thomas uh, as well. As you can see, it's a, it's a big project at the moment. There we are. So what, what, what is the Global Mango Watch then? It's, uh, uh, um, it has, you can say it's a, it's a consistent global data set that we are generating of global mangrove extent and changes. So, um, and we have uh, at the moment, I believe it's 11 uh, annual epochs between 1996 and 2020, and they're generated from earth observation data. And we have been using a, a combination of, of satellite radar from uh, the Japanese JIRS-1, ADOS and ADOS-2 uh, missions. Uh, the advantage of, of using um, uh, radar is that you you can you can see through clouds. You can you can you can acquire data through clouds and smoke and and, and haze. And uh, the radar is sensitive to vegetation structure, so it's very good for detection of, of changes. Um, and we have been using the the radar data sets for all the the uh, uh, the eleven data sets that we have generated uh, to date. Uh, we're also using optical, uh, at the moment, Landsat data, but in the future, we will also be using uh, Sentinel-2 uh, for the actual baseline data sets, because optical data is very good for, for distinction of mangrove, non-mangrove. Uh, but there is a limit, limitation of, of cloud cover and data availability. So it has been used only for the, uh, for the baseline data sets that, that we have. Um, 
this is an example. Uh, at the moment, uh, the data set that we have online is what we call 2.0, and it stretches up to 2016. Uh, but we are uh, we have finalized the version 3.0, and we are just in the in the process of, of doing the the accurate assessment and pushing to uh, or pu uh, putting together a, a publication for that one. With this one, we have added the, those last four years, and the the intention is to keep on generating these data sets on an annual basis, also uh, after mm -hmm. 2020. Um, compared to the to the previous ver version 2.0, we have uh, there were a number of areas where we were made aware that um, data were missing, uh, so we have gap filled uh, those areas. And this data set 3.0 uh, is planned to be released um, before uh, Global Mangrove uh, or World Mangrove Day uh, this year in July 26. You can see at the at the kind of lower part here, uh, it's just a kind of a, um, um, a time sequence of some different mangrove areas uh, and the the classification that that we're having. The Global Mangrove Watch at the moment, I mean, uh, the the main um, uh, place where you can interact with the data is the Global Mangrove Watch platform. Um, it's, it's up there. Um, the data is also available for, for public open access. So uh, the uh, UNEP WCMC, the Ocean Data Viewer, that's where we keep the vector data sets. And uh, JAXA, uh, Earth, Earth Observation Research Center, they uh, host the, the raster data in GeoTIFF format. Um, and you can just kind of go and download the data there. And then the last slide is just to, to show that the Global Mangrove Watch data set is actually used by quite a number of, of different um, entities kind of around the world. Um, so so um, amongst others, it is the, the let's say, official mangrove layer for the SDG661 um, uh, app uh, hosted by, by UNEP. And we have Stuart Train here we might talk more about that uh, later. Uh, just to say that uh, it is a very established data set and it is something that we intend to keep on generating for a long time. And we, it is also part of the, uh, of the current uh, Geo Wetlands uh, website uh, or uh, website. But I think that there is a, a kind of um, an opportunity to, to make it much more, say, um, active than, than uh, what it is now on the on the Geo Wetlands website. So I'm happy to continue to, to discuss that. Thank you. Thanks, Aka. That was uh, spot on in content and timing. Um, we'll, we'll, what we'll do is we'll do all the presentations and then if questions come in, we can do that at the end. And I'll look at the chat to make sure I catch that as well. Um, we're now going to move to uh, freshwater uh, BON, which is a biodiversity observation network, and uh, hopefully we'll have Erin Turak. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm Erin uh, Turak. I'm co-chair of Freshwater Biodiversity Observation Network. Um, I also um, work for a, a government conservation um, a national parks agency in Australia. Uh, that's my day job. But um, Freshwater Biodiversity Conservation uh, Observation Network is a global community practice. We are part of GeoBond um, and um, we started actually as a working group within GeoBond in 2009 and in 2016 we became a, a separate entity. So our main focus is on facilitating global assessment of freshwater biodiversity. At the moment, uh, our focus is, is really on the global biodiversity um, framework. Um, so we're, we're generating um, data and methods to support uh, the indicators as a priority. Um, and our work um, involves in situ a lot of our programs, the programs that we support are involved in such as the Arctic, circumpolar biodiversity, freshwater biodiversity um, monitoring program um, is um, based on in-situ observations, but we um, connect that to earth observation work as well. 
And we're, we're involved in all level of organization, biological observations, gene species ecosystems. We're, we're a network. Um, we don't have resources at the center, um, but we have uh, over 360 members at the moment from 85 countries in all continents. And our governance is, is essentially we have a coordination uh, committee with three co-chairs, myself in Australia, Jennifer Lento in Canada, Andreas Bruder in Switzerland. And part, uh, in our governing body, we have two uh, to three coordinators from each continent. And these include Erin Hester from the US and for North America and Heidi van de Venter from South Africa. They will both be presenting, giving presentations today. They are, are specialists, uh, experts in earth observation uh, in our coordination committee. The rest of us are mainly work on um, species and ecos ecosystems um, and uh, biological communities. And because Erin Hester will be presenting in the afternoon, I just have one slide that I'll quickly go through. Uh, something that I, I don't have a lot of background in this work, but um, it, is, it is work that is contributing to some of our uh, really innovative um, contributions or work uh, to, to uh, global biodiversity measurements. And she's been working on uh, using remote sensing to, to um, track invasive species in, in California. And uh, the, basically what they found is that remote sensing provides repeatable consisting monitoring of vegetation functional types and invasive species. And in particular, drone mounted hyperspectral uh, spectral sensors achieved comparable accuracy and improved spatial resolution compared with um, uh, airplane uh, uh, sensors. And the, the results for species in gen, genus level mapping were, were very uh, impressive. But Erin Hester will be talking about this in more detail in the afternoon session. Um, finally, I just want to express how um, excited I am to that, uh, that Geo Wetlands Initiative is, is uh, revitalizing. We, have a very strong common shared history with geo wetlands. Uh, we we work with um, you know Mark, Edwin, and Lamet are all members of Freshwater Bond. Um, we share the same vision on the geo. We share the history of working on GWAS in the early days in 2011 and SWAS. Um, so uh, it's very exciting. Uh, to, to have this prospect. Uh, Freshwater Bond has revitalized as well in the last 12 years. We have gained a huge momentum at the moment. And um, we the task we're facing is huge. It's very diverse. We uh, are aiming to facilitate tracking change in multiple dimensions of biodiversity from species populations to ecosystem function and structure. And this is where there's a huge complementarity between our strengths and the strengths of geo wetlands. So once again, thank you for having me in this workshop. And uh, we are very much looking forward to, to collaboration and working with geo wetlands. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Aaron. Um, so we, Aaron just mentioned um, Heidi van de Venter. And so I'm going to move over to Heidi now, who's going to talk about monitoring wetlands in South Africa. Fantastic. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about what we're doing in South Africa for wetlands. I think that the main message I want to get across to everyone is South Africa is a semi-arid to arid country and in a temperate climate um, environment. And uh, we find that the global products only monitors and detects less than 13% of the extent of all wetlands in South Africa. They, they're mainly narrow and shallow and, and also vegetated. And therefore it's important for us to develop some of our own products. We have a South African Mzanzi Amanzi data set that's monitoring um, open water bodies monthly. 
and it uses Sentinel-1 and 2 at a 20 meter spatial resolution. And from this information on the right hand side, you can see that we can derive biodiversity types and monitor the hydrological regime and also track lag events in, in the hydrological regime. We also have an open water, a water quality monitoring system that's also running constantly. This is for 103 large open water bodies of which one is located in Swaziland, but, but the rest are all in South Africa. And this was developed by Mark Matthews from Cyano Lakes and it monitors 92 artificial, five estuaries and six inland wetlands. And it's available on various platforms. The, the screen clips that I've made on the right hand side is from a mobile app where you can actually monitor individual lakes and it's available to the whole public. We also have some marine earth observation products. Uh, this is an example from my colleagues um, for, for uh, Marco South, which is an area from the northern border of um, Tanzania, all the way south to 40 degrees. Um, and yeah, you can see they monitor a number of products, so chlorophyll, uh, sea surface temperature and other anomalies. And they also have products of, uh, for fisheries and aquaculture decision support tools, which monitors harmful algal blooms. But when we get to vegetated or palestrine wetlands, we don't have any operational monitoring systems. And it's estimated that about 55% of the extent of our wetlands are vegetated. In fact, mostly located on the Eastern side where, where it's wetter in the country, whereas we have 11% um, open water systems and 34% ephemeral systems. That is uh, when they inundate, it's too shallow to detect with the global surface water products. Um, and we're also not sure if they vegetate it. So further work is really uh, necessary on these um, two types of wetlands. And a lot of research work is being done, but at finer scales to regional scales. And we've got interesting delineation of our ecosystem functional groups, mostly being forested wetlands, large macrophytes and, and marshes. We did do some work on community level, wetland vegetation communities, but um, that requires a lot more work. We also have a focus on soil moisture for our Palestrine wetlands, not only for delineation, but also determining your biodiversity types and also their hydrological regime, the quantification of above ground um, biomass and teal carbon quantification and monitoring of habitat types, rates in decline for rate list of ecosystems. Uh, we also have invasive species monitoring and for the first time we'll be doing some uh, social engagement uh, about the importance of wetlands and our remote sensing products. Um, but lastly, we have interest in comparison of all the spaceborne, airborne and radon optical sensors. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Fantastic. That was, uh, that was, that was great. You powered through that. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Heidi. <laughs> um, so we'll move on now to uh, Globe Wetland Africa. And this is going to be Christian Tutrup and uh, I think Michael Riefler as well. Thanks a lot. And yes, as, as just said, uh, this will be a joint presentation between myself and Michael Riefler on the Globe Wetland Africa project. So um, we have a few slides here, but we will try to be quick and, and, and respect our time. But uh, I will just give the brief background before Michael will end up showing some of our latest uh, project results. But uh, the Globe Wetland Africa was a, or is, was, yeah, is a large application project funded by the European Space Agency uh, together with the Ramsar Convention. And it was uh, initiated back in 2015, I think, uh, to facilitate uh, the exploitation of uh, mainly the Sentinel data for, um, for supporting uh, wetland monitoring in Africa and to provide uh, methods and tools to uh, support countries in fulfilling their obligations towards the Ramsar Convention. The focus was really to demonstrate the versatility of what to say, you know, the, uh, the ability of the Sentinel to support a broad range of uh, wet wetland information products that included wetland inventorying, wetland habitat mapping, monitoring of the inundation re regime, uh, water quality assessment, modeling of the river basin hydrology, and, and uh, also um, some activities on mangroves mapping. And you know, that focus on this broad range of information products meant the project was uh, demonstrated and ex executed on a site-by-site -site basin uh, covering, I think, plus 50 um, 
Ramsar and non-Ramsar wetland sites in, in Africa. Um, but during the course of the project, you can say it also became very clear that there was really an information gap in terms of these national wetland inventories and, and the need uh, to, to maybe uh, focus some, uh, some efforts in that direction. So in, um, in 2019, when, when the, you could say the original project was uh, completed, uh, we got a project extension uh, where we could uh, get some dedicated effort to consolidate the metals uh, for national wetland uh, inventorying and, and trying to, to fill in that, um, uh, that information gap. Uh, so that's really uh, the scene of what we have done for the past uh, five, five to six years. Uh, before uh, Michael will present some of the latest results, I just want to see it. It's really more than maybe just the club in Africa. What, what we have built off of experience is really based on a decade long, uh, uh, you can say, partnership with, with ESA in executing uh, projects with a focus on water resources, wetlands, and SDGs. And um, so, so there's really a lot of uh, of experience and uh, an engagement with, with key stakeholders during this uh, this time period. Uh, and now, um, Michael, I will let you give some methodological insights and project results. Yeah, thank you. And, and you have to be uh, my remote. Just, yeah, yeah, you just let me know. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to give you a little bit of background on the on the methodology. So Kristen has just presented the, the, the project where we have uh, worked on these approaches and uh, the overall aim uh, in our approach is uh, that we can support uh, national, regional, or even continental scale, large scale mapping in a cost effective and sustainable uh, way, meaning so working on highly automated or fully automated approaches. Uh, next. This means that uh, we are focusing on, on optical and radar-based um, data, so running a hybrid approach where we really try to leverage, uh, the, let's say, the advantages uh, of, of both uh, systems, optical, multispectral um, uh, data, and then yeah, using unsupervised and supervised classification approaches. And you all know that there is challenges uh, with cloud confusion, um, with cloud shadows. And in dense vegetations, and then for the radar-based um, thing, we also use this information uh, to extract uh, surface soil moisture and to do water mapping, and to particularly uh, address, uh, let's say, uh, these, these cloudy regions. But definitely, it also uh, brings challenges uh, in arid regions uh, and with uh, the confusion with flat surfaces, for instance, uh, with uh, salt uh, um, salt pans, etc. And just next, please. We published um, uh, at least the, the optical based um, uh, in, in uh, RSE paper, so that uh, can also be, so if you're interested in the full details, uh, you can have a look uh, into this paper. Next, please. So just quickly on the on the methodology, what, what we do in the end is that we have like, uh, we try to map uh, monthly uh, water and, and wet soil um, uh, extent. Uh, in order to uh, come up with frequencies. And if you show the next one, we can then combine this into a water and wetness uh, presence index and which can then be uh, where you can then in the end apply uh, some kind of rule-based classification, meaning that uh, it allows a lot of flexibility. Uh, the most important thing I want to highlight here is that you all know that the wetlands are highly dynamic uh, environments and therefore we have, uh, we go with this time series approach and really try to leverage uh, the um, the, the information out of the full time series. We have also applied this uh, on European scale for the uh, Copernicus water and wetness, um, high resolution layers in 215 and 218. On the left hand, it shows just this uh, water and wetness um, presence index. And then on the, on the right hand side, you see the, uh, the classification as it was requested by the European uh, Environment Agency. And now I just want to show uh, a few more examples. Um, for instance, here, um, comparison between, let's say, uh, showing a little bit of the, the development history. On the right-hand side, you see a version of our product um, more or less four or five years ago, or yeah, roughly four years ago. And now with the, with the newest developments where we include soil moisture information, so full information coming from Sentinel-1, but also from the optical, we were able to uh, much improve the product and it's just shown here. The, the pre inventory uh, map, the most recent one uh, for the uh, country of uh, Uganda. 
One more example for Namibia. Uh, you know that uh, Namibia is a very dry country, uh, but also and also a very large country. So here we have uh, processed the data uh, to highlight uh, the the moisture, or let's say for this dry country, although uh, the, the moist regions in the north, and it also has been confirmed by the country uh, that uh, our um, product is very useful in order for them to identify um, uh, their, their wetlands, um, even in these dry regions. One more example for uh, Tunisia, uh, another example from a national map where you can also see that with this uh, time series based approach, we are also um, able to uh, map dry regions uh, in, in deserts, which are still uh, moist for some time throughout the year. And what we also try to do is uh, shown in the in the next slide um, is that uh, we try to uh, work on the uh, Ramsar typology, so on the on this uh, division into um, human uh, coastal and inland um, wetlands in an automated uh, manner. And just a few examples shown here. So, which is in the end also to address that in a in a fully automated approach is highly challenging. Uh, but um, yeah, first steps done uh, towards this. And um, uh, we are certainly interested in, in providing this, uh, uh, in uh, processing this for other areas and, uh, as well and, and run additional tests. A final uh, summary. So what we have worked on is an optical and radar based pro uh, product. So really making, um, trying to get the best out of both uh, sensors. Uh, in order to de um, detect water and, and wet soil surfaces. The main products we get is the water and wetness frequencies, um, as shown here on a, uh, before in a, on a monthly basis, which can be then translated into a water and wetness presence index. And then you can uh, combine that also with uh, additional uh, maps and information uh, to get user-specific um, uh, classifications. Um, it's running on, on cloud infrastructure, address accessible via uh, API-based services. And we have that it has been validated uh, in Europe from external entity and for Africa, uh, we did uh, uh, internal um, uh, validation and the overall accuracies are really uh, good and promising. And yeah, that was uh, what we had to present from Global Africa and our activities uh, over the past more or less 10 years. Thank you. Perfect, thank, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, so we have two more presentations to go. Uh, the penultimate one is going to be now from Suhe bin Farhan, who's going to talk about mangrove monitoring in Pakistan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Seaman. Uh, okay, thank you. Hello and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am Suhe bin Farhan, uh, associated with Pakistan Space and uh, Paratmas Research Commission, Subako. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to Geo Secretariat for uh, providing us uh, such a wonderful platform to discuss the current needs and applications of Earth observations to support wetlands uh, management. Uh, well, uh, today uh, I'm going to talk uh, uh, about research project on and group forest along the coast of Pakistan through space science and uh, technology. Um, uh, in fact, the coastline of Pakistan is uh, more than 1,000 kilometers longer, distributed between the Sindh and Balochistan provinces, uh, and its uh, exclusive economic zone covers an area of uh, 290,000 square kilometers. Uh, Pakistan coast is mainly divided into Makran and Sindh coastal ranges, uh, which um, uh, basically the Makran coastal range uh, uh, forms a narrow strip of mountains with unique landforms such as sandy beaches, mud flats, lagoons, mud volcanoes, rock cliffs, uh, head and sand bays, uh, uh, whereas the Sindh coast is mainly in this with SGDs, deltas, and uh, mangrove forests. Uh, so let's uh, talk uh, something about mangroves, uh, which are basically one of the most uh, productive uh, ecosystem, uh, which offers uh, services, for the services uh, for climate change, adaptation, and mitigation. And uh, mangroves are hardy trees and shrubs that grow in the salty, wet, muddy soil of uh, Earth's tropical and uh, subtropical coastlines. Uh, they generally protect the coastline from erosion and storm damages uh, and store carbon within their roots, trunks, and uh, as well as in the soil and provide the habitats for commercially important, important uh, marine species. Um, if we talk about the mangroves in Pakistan, which are mainly distributed along the coastline of Sindh and as well as the Sun provinces, and uh, the mangroves in Pakistan are considered uh, uh, one of the top few mangrove forests in the world, which uh, covers an area of more than 14,000 square kilometers. Uh, 
um additionally for the conservation of mangroves in pakistan in the 1972 uh, mangrove forest of pakistan were uh, declared as uh, protected forests uh the mangroves uh, have been threatened uh, by deforestation for decades uh, as uh, agriculture and uh, aquaculture urban development and harvesting have caused uh, the loss of more than a quarter of mangrove forest in the past 50 years across the globe um, forest particularly in southeast asia have been especially uh, hard hit as uh, several countries clear mangroves to make room uh, for shrimps and rice farming However, uh, the case is slightly different in Pakistan. Uh, we employed the Landsat temporal imagery to estimate the changes in mangrove cover for the past 30 years, and uh, it has been uh, identified that uh, the mangroves have been drastically increased during this uh, period. The main reason for that increase uh, is the vast level of uh, man made uh, plantation of mangroves by the relevant uh, government agencies in Pakistan in cooperation with uh, NGOs, as well as uh, a strict. Uh, uh, preservation laws on cutting of uh, mangoes uh, across the country. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, in this map, you can see that uh, uh, the red color is showing uh, the depletion of mangroves in few areas uh, during the same period, uh, but the rate of uh, depletion uh, seems uh, very low. Uh, and uh, in the same project, uh, we are also going to map and discriminate uh, the various types of uh, mangroves uh, species uh, found in Pakistan. Similarly, uh, as we discussed earlier, that uh, the mangroves uh, protect the land and shoreline uh, from uh, coastal erosion. Here we can see that uh, this map is clearly depicting, depicting that uh, the erosion only took place where there were no mangroves in Pakistan and represents how they are protecting it uh, from the uh, coastal erosion. So uh, this project is currently undergo and uh, we are uh, uh, utilizing various kind of satellite mode sensing data sets, uh, optical as well as the, uh, the satellite SAR imagery uh, for the better mapping and improvement of uh, results uh, uh, from these uh, studies. So due to the shortage, shortage of time, I would just uh, uh, wind up my presentation here. That's all from my side. Thank you very much for your uh, patience and attention. Thank you. Thank you, Srinivas. Thank, thank you, Sohit. And so uh, we're perfect timing, I think. Um, we'll now move to Min Yang, uh, who will talk about China's system for wetlands monitoring. So this is the last uh, presentation in this part of the session. And then... Okay, okay. Yeah, I will introduce the China system for wetland monitoring. Yeah, uh, I come from the Northeast Institute of the Geography. Yeah, uh, this uh, uh, monitor, wetland monitoring was uh, supported by uh, National Forestry and Grassland Administration and the Ministry of Natural Resources of People's Republic of China. Uh, I will introduce two programs. One is wetland monitoring network in China. The yeah. another one is global water related ecosystem exchange. Uh, you know, the, in China, we, uh, the China government has uh, performed three national wetland resource inventories. Uh, the first one is the uh, 2003, the third one, two, uh, 2015, the third one is 2020, yeah. Yeah, the first one is the, the last inventory area is uh, 100 hectare. Uh, the wetland area is uh, 36 meter hectare. The second one, uh, the second uh, inventory, uh, the last uh, inventory area is uh, 8 hectare. The, uh, the area is uh, 53 meter hectare. The, the last one, the area is the 4 hectare. The, the area is uh, 58 meter hectare, the wetland all over China. Yeah. Also, we have uh, 64 wetland uh, uh, has been uh, designated as wrong size. Yeah. Also, uh, uh, every every year we will uh, develop the monitoring. Uh, in China, we have the wetland monitoring stations network, uh, especially for the third. Yeah, uh, more than 20 wetland monitoring stations and uh, continuous monitoring. Also, some sharing indicators 
such as uh, climate, uh, climate, vegetation, water, and the soil uh, is uh, 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 also for some flux data, such as EP. Uh, also, in my institute, we have uh, six uh, wetland monitoring uh, species yeah, uh, uh, located in, in the northeast of China. Yeah. Also, we have the wetlands database yeah, uh, in my institute. Yeah, yeah, it, it can uh, public free availability the data is one T more than one TB. Yeah. Uh, the second uh, program is a global water related ecosystem exchange. Yeah. Uh, the first uh, uh, I will introduce one Changguo um, satellite technology company. Yeah, uh, this company uh, yeah uh, have a cooperation with my institute. The Chilin. GD1 um, satellites, uh, have, uh, the, the company have 46 satellites. Uh, it can revisit any place in the world, 18 to 20 times a day. And uh, yes, yeah, so it can uh, provide some technical uh, the data source support yeah, for, for our program. Also, we uh, we, we aim to map the uh, distribution of vegetated wetland, mangroves, coastal aquaculture ponds, uh, use the image of 10 meter resolution. Also, the global mangrove and coastal uh, aquaculture pond uh, data set uh, have been done. Also, we will, for the global lake extent and quality, we, we, we aim to examine the distribution and the changes of global lakes. Uh, predict the global pattern of water clarity and uh, chlor chlorophyll. Also, uh, we did some uh, algal balloons yeah, the, from 1982 to 2018 yeah, has, has been detected and also published uh, in the uh, TCP journal. Yeah. The next, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, we will do some do some works for the data inter integration from regional China and global. Also, we will uh, con consistent measurement on the wetland current flood uh, based on the wetland monitoring station. Also, we will improve wetland research networks. Yeah. Also, we will um, perform new national wetland resource inventory uh, based on the, the government. Uh, also, uh, also a lot of work uh, to translate some website, well, website and the database to English. Yeah, now most database in Chinese. Be nice, maybe we can develop some some work to translate here yeah, uh, to share our data. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the GEO, especially for Wenbo and uh, Dorit who invite us to attend this workshop. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Xie Xie, thank you for uh, that was perfect timing and, and, and some great content. Um, I, I have to um, contradict myself. We have an additional speaker, one final speaker, who is Mark uh, Despinoy from IRD in uh, New Caledonia. So yes. um, he's going to talk about the EO Mangrove Observatory at the scale of tropical island environment. Hello, everyone. So uh, rapidly, my name is Marc Despinois from the French Research Institute uh, for the Development uh, IRD. And uh, thank you for this beautiful presentation and projects. That's very congratulations to the organizer also. So major programs uh, were presented today uh, for wetland management policy and large scale uh, data recovery. One of the presentation uh, asked for ideas and contribution and participation. And uh, I propose to present some field actions using satellite images and more uh, that I've carried out um, in the framework of contribution and participation. I propose to present some field action using satellite imagery. Oops, sorry. <laughs> and uh, so these 
sorry, these actions is on uh, intertropical geographical uh, areas where we have several uh, representations. These are some projects for development of tools and methods for processing special data in response to their identified needs of population and decision maker in uh, coastal wetlands, uh, so-called so mangroves. So uh, the objective uh, so of the following project uh, that I present here is uh, to have enough, da enough data of these intertropical areas to adapt image processing models and mangrove observation tools to the environments uh, observed. So the, um, the underlying ideas of this project is also to mobilize society. So I mean by societies that all the people, decision makers and scientists, etc., to safeguard and restore a coastal wetland for people and nature. So that the overall project objective is uh, to pull, co-construct and disseminate approaches to monitoring coastal risk prevention and adaptation to climate change. So the, the stakes, I mean, challenges of the project are safety of goods and population and tourist economy through uh, the maintain maintenance of beaches and uh, the preservation of the natural heritage of these interface environments. And uh, the principal actions is on the modeling and coastal hydrodynamics, the monitoring and um, mitigation and, uh, of coastal um, erosions, and decision-making tools, erosion risk management, adaptation and restoration of uh, ecosystem services. So this is done on uh, over 15 pilot sites, sites sorry, in six territories, which are Jamaica, Puerto Rico, uh, St. Martins, Guadeloupe, Martinique, Trinidad and Tobacco. This is the Carib Coast pro project. And the role of IAD in this Carib Coast project is to develop an ecosystem-based coastal vulnerability index. Uh, we call it EBCVI, which is um, a coastal vulnerability index to erosion based on the more, more or less effective protection provided by the mangrove depending on its uh, characteristics, which is um, another, yeah, another project on Guiana Shield. So uh, Guiana Shield is uh, three territories involved uh, this, which is uh, which are Suriname, um, French Guiana, and Brazil. So the objective is to promote the development of application using special data around three major major axes. So the special planning, the environmental health, uh, the knowledge and preservation of bio biodiversity. Uh, so the project aim is uh, to formalize and put into operation services for assessing, processing and disseminating geo-information for communities in charge of environmental management. So the six thematic has been identified uh, in, um, in, orange, uh, in the orange square. And uh, the contribution of the IRD is uh, to, um, uh, to develop uh, two data cubes to produce and make available data dedicated to the monitoring of uh, flood, flood, flood plain, sorry, hydrodynamics and deforestation in the Amazon. And the second point is to, uh, to do a biodiversity indexes of mangrove on mangrove forest derived from uh, earth observation data. <clears throat> For this uh, SOS Mambo project, uh, the objective is to develop a processing method combining the optical data as a Sentinel-2 or Playet, which is a submetric uh, images, and multiband multi uh, SAR data. So Terrasas X band, Sentinel 1 C band, and the Pulsar 2 L band, in order to study the spatial temporal dynamics of mangrove distribution. You can see here the, um, the description of uh, the graphical description of the of the model, and um, at the bottom you, we have um, the last. You see the, the the blue one, the blue square one, with the, the classification of mangrove environment and a flood frequency map, which is produced and given to the local environmental institution. So this is uh, it's um, it's a time series of uh, Sentinel One images for one year, and uh, with threshold 
called um, frequency, uh, uh, follow my, my English, <laughs> Otsu, uh, we, 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 Otsu method, we, we have the... Um, the the uh, dynamic, dynamic thresholding, I guess you mean, huh? Yeah, uh, yeah exactly, <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. And th this Otsu uh, method is used on uh, each image to count the number of times a pixel is flooded during the year. This is this information is particularly necessary for mangrove restoration and replanting sites. So uh, this project uh, also served to provide developments and knowledge for SPASDEF in its broader observatory project on French overseas territories. So um, so the next one, I don't know if you have it. Yeah. So the next one is, um, it's, um, it's a paper uh, that, um, a, that was published uh, on the year before. Uh, so the, finally, the mangrove provide the essential ecosystem services and contribute to the good functioning of coral reef and seagrass beds. That, uh, we know that. And uh, this paper emphasizes uh, on the value of ecosystem services provided by mangrove in French overseas territories, of course, and to face coastal change to that that a service based on the conservation would plead for in increased national investment into their protection. So um, the authors provide an economic value of mangroves for coastal protection, carbon sequestration, water purification, and fish biomass production. They estimate the monetary value of regulation and support services provided by mangrove in French overseas territories to be an average of uh, 1.6 billion of the euro annually. And 50% of this is uh, carbon sequestration, 28% coastal protection, and 7% only water purification and 6% fish, fish biomass production. They develop also um, a vulnerability index based on multiple indicators of exposure to uh, an environmental uh, and anthropogenic stressors, mangroves sensitivity to pressures, and mangroves adaptive capacity to adjust their production functions accordingly. So the next step could be uh, to consider all activities occurs in catchment and uh, not only the one occurring at the immediate vicinity of the mangrove. And this, um, this sum of authors present here uh, from uh, our um, research unit in, uh, in France. So that's the reason why I expose this, uh, I present this. Um, this paper. So, um, okay, so next one. Uh, thank you for, uh, for inviting me and uh, to the uh, workshop and uh, for giving me the opportunity to present some of our action on the wetland, especially on coastal wetlands. So thank you very, very, very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Mark, and apologies for the confusion with the slides. Yeah, um, sorry. Okay, I think, uh, thanks to all presenters. As I said, if you have additional questions, please put them in the chat. We will now, I'll hand back to Laurent and we'll move to the Miro exercise. Uh, over to you, Laurent. Thank you very much, Stephen and Mark, for uh, this session. Uh, as you have seen, we wanted to invite our colleagues to, to try to understand better who is doing what and how we could contribute. So now, as you've seen, we have uh, this huge amount of uh, uh, research and development toward operational products for wetlands uh, inventory monitoring and assessment. We uh, had at the beginning our Ramsar colleague expressing actually what was the needs. We are also Stuart from UNEP uh, also reminding that they were also custodian of SG 6.6.1. And I think it's now a good moment based on all what all this knowledge we will receive to, uh, to share um, uh, uh, a moment of discussion. Uh, sure. We can, uh, we, we, go, we are going to, going to share with you um, um, a mirror link. So I don't know if Julie uh, can uh, can come and Samuel, Julie and Samuel can come and explain us how this will work technically, and we will um, uh, we will then explain about the content of this exercise. Julie, Samuel, and so is, this is a proposal. I mean, we we have a half an hour now just to to discuss. Uh, we, we didn't want to have a, a classical Q&A because we didn't want to have more details than we already received from our colleagues on all the different uh, existing programs. What we wanted is uh, uh, to uh, identify uh, what are the existing programs that could contribute to, to this geowetland activity uh, and to which needs they could contribute. And when we talk about needs here, well, um, we, we took a list of needs that come from uh, one of the Ramsar documents about uh, what EO can actually uh, uh, bring to, uh, to answer um, 
wetlands um, inventory monitoring and assessment needs. So uh, we, 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 we may first start to, to as, as, as we discussed it, we have a, a huge issue about uh, wetland extent. Uh, and uh, we also said that it was not only this. So uh, we, we propose this, this first list, but this list also we can uh, add things about it. So I would like to have some feedback already from our Ramstar colleague, either Maria or Lisa, about how we can define better uh, to which needs Earth observation can actually answer. So this would be the first discussion. And then, as you see on this mural, we propose to have to, to make some simple link just about the scope of the different programs, scope in terms of uh, local, national, I, 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 I would like to, to, to so you, I hope you can access, and I hope Samuel or Julie can answer people in the chat if they are not accessing. And I see many people on, already on this mirror, that is fun, that is great. Um, uh, Lisa, Maria, uh, we, we, we created this first list, but uh, of needs to which EO can actually provide information. We would like to have uh, first feedback uh, and feel free to edit it. And we, I hope we can change everything about that. Um, uh, and also remind that this session is being recorded. So we will go back to it. And as we said, it's a prototype brainstorm session. So we will try to improve about it. So um, feel really free to express uh, what you think about this exercise. And um, uh, I don't know if Maria or Lisa or Jerko or the colleagues from also Stuart want to already uh, uh, comment about uh, this list of needs and what we need to change about this list. Any comment from, from our colleagues, Ramsar colleagues side? So me, me oh, some, yeah, Mark, I think please. there is, uh, no, no, I wanted to say something, but I see that um, the convention on, on wetlands is rising his hand, so. Yeah, please, I don't, I don't know see, who is. Uh, yeah, just. I don't please, know if it's Yaka uh, yeah, or Maria. Just, just, yeah, it's, I, don't know. It's, I, I would like to say a few things as well. Okay, yeah. Okay. Mark, go yeah. ahead. I can I can wait. Okay, no, no, no. I, I, I just wanted to remind a few things. First, on the policy framework, it's clear that the Ramsar Convention is is a, let's say one of our primary policy stakeholders. Uh, so it's the strategy plan of Ramsar, 2016-2014. Uh, we, we know that wetland inventory is a top priority. By wetland inventory, is not only delineations of wetlands uh, in terms of wetlands, no wetlands. There is also the classification of wetlands in, in, the, in the Ramsar topologies. So it's definitely a, a, an important need from, from Ramsar. But Ramsar has other, let's say, uh, uh, targets, let's say, that are extremely relevant as well for geo-wetlands. And then in terms of policy framework, of course, we mentioned the DSDGs, but there is also the UN decade of restoration. To a certain extent, the, the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, so especially on, on, on flood reductions. There is the, cli the, climate, the, uh, so the, the Paris Agreement and the Glasgow Climate Pact that was mentioned by, um, by Lisa. There is the post-2020 global uh, uh, biodiversity framework. So you, there's a whole set, and the UN decade of the restoration. So there is a whole set of policy sectors where definitely geo wetlands can can contribute to to but we, we need to, to be focused at some point. So we need really to give priorities to a certain number of, of activities. And what we got from Ramsar is that wetland inventories is really the top priorities. But uh, you should not forget that when we express, let's say, the the the, the, the mission of, of geo wetlands, we say that it's a community effort to develop, sustain a globally applicable earth observation approach to wetland inventory, mapping, monitoring, and assessment. So we go, we want also to go beyond wetland inventories and access as well the conditions, so the eco ecological characters of wetlands. The services are also very important. And we saw from the very last presentation, so important as it is as well to assess this, and this is probably needs um, having some modeling aspects as well, uh, and we need to relate it also this to the to the new ecosystem accounting standards that is put in place by by the SEA, eh, the, the system for environment and, and economic and economic account. So you see, there is also a number of thematic accounts that are very important, like the carbon accounting. So you see, I just want to throw to you a lot of things, ju just to make to make sure that actually when you, when you fill in this table, you think 
about all the aspects of wetland. It's also about wetland degradation. It's also about wetland conservation. It's also about, about wetland restoration. We should not forget also the biodiversity. We saw the presentation from the freshwater biodiversity observation networks on, 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 on the EBVs, eh, on the accession biodiversity variables that are also very relevant for wetlands. So going from ecosystems to, to species. Eh, so it's not only about ecosystems. And you know, and there is this complexity of the wetlands. So sometimes we have we have seen a lot of presentations to their mangroves so but it's but there are different type of, of of wetlands and some of these wetland types are not so well monitored nowadays eh? mangroves is probably the one that is the best let's say monitor you've seen the number of products available but if we move to salt marshes if we move to uh, to other type of uh, of wetlands to peatlands in some aspects because peatlands is also a top priority there are some more work to to be done eh? and so and the last point that I want to raise before I give the floor to Ramsar, think also about what is the target users, because in some cases we have global users, huh? of course the ones that are also looking for global metrics and, uh, and global indicators, but we have also the regional initiative that are very important as well as different aspects that can be also a regional basing authority that needs also to protect the wetlands and of course the countries. Huh? And the countries is probably our top let's say users, because at the, end, at the end, we want to build capacities in the countries to have a really an efficient uh, national wetland invent, uh, monitoring. Yeah? Thanks, so I wanted Mark, really Mark, to, yeah. to throw Thank, many things. Yeah. I would like just to, you. to, to uh, interrupt you one second, because I'd like to have from Julie and Sam, because we, we see our people already playing very well on this mirror platform. Just Julie or Sam, if you can explain, because I've seen some people putting lines without uh, taking it account the scope. So can you just let us know how we do this better? Um, Julie, please. Uh, so yes, please, when you draw the line, the connection between the program and the needs, um, we will need to have the color changed. So I don't know if you see the little box uh, with the instructions. So it just says to change the color of the connection line depending on the scope of your program. So if it is local, national, regional, or global. So to change it to red, blue, green, or, or yellow. All right, Thank thanks for, to take this in account. Thanks so much, Julie. Yeah, back to our Ramsar colleagues, and then we'll give you the voice to Stuart, please. Um, oh, sorry, uh, let me see, okay. You can see me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Jarka Tamalander uh, at the Convention Secretariat. Um, just wanted to have a brief reflection building quite nicely on from what Mark said, in that uh, there's obviously many possible uses of Earth observation in relation to wetlands. There's a diversity of needs depending on context. And uh, just a reminder on Maria's presentation earlier on that the origins of the wetland inventories, of course, uh, within the convention and specifically to support decision making, support policy development um, and implementation at the national level. And then on the basis of that, you have further sort of treaty based obligations in relation to reporting and, and global tracking. And the national system is uh, ultimately uh, the basis for proper global tracking, which means that it becomes the entry point for having a, a good solid global systems. Um, so so there's a, at the core, it's that point. Uh, secondly is, um, is, of course, we're talking about extent a lot. And that's obviously, again, a, a central provision. Thank you for mentioning the classification system, hugely important. Um, there's also a number of other resolutions that I think Lisa referenced that speak to how we can use inventories for specific uh, purposes, including in relation to climate change. So greenhouse gas fluxes for the purpose of updating greenhouse gas account, uh, greenhouse gas fluxes for the purpose of incorporating wetlands actions into NDCs. Um, there's resolutions uh, in relation to small wetlands. We saw really interesting data presented from China on small wetlands and their contribution to the overall wetland area, for example. Uh, restoration, the point was made before, hugely important element on many levels at this point in time. And again, strong footprint in the decisions of the convention, strong footprint in other decisions also in broader frameworks, including, of course, the UN decade. Um, so, um, so I think, I guess my main point here is uh, it's, 
it's good to see this observing system approach uh, being mentioned early on in the sense that there's uh, it sets out this uh, hierarchy or a nested approach. It, it establishes what's what's a good framework for ocean observation, or ocean for <laughs> wetland observation, and uh, and uh, and is something that we should uh, keep at the at the core of our discussions. Um, last point, perhaps before I end, is also um, again Mark raised a few interesting points on on what specificity there is. We speak a lot about ecological character status within the framework of the convention. Again, can be many different things, but it's very important to say, well, what's uh, what are the priorities there? That's not to exclude matters that relate to ecosystem service provision. And again, I think this is explicitly recognized in resolutions by the convention that uh, that you do inventory also in order to better understand, cater to and manage service provision, how we draw on those services and so on, which again uh, uh, is, is, is very central. So not a ready-made answer, really interesting discussions, but, but that, that nested approach is probably a, a very important way to go so that you maximize the benefit for, uh, for how this uh, uh, earth observation is, is taken up and, and utilized in the long term for a long term sort of sustainable impact, let's say. And sorry, there was one more point I wanted to mention, which is, uh, which is that the technological side is, of course, hugely important. The structural sides of, of that is very important. But let's not forget the institutional side and, and uh, jurisdictional aspects where, you know, how data is managed, how inventories are compiled, are very much about an institutional landscape that is also uh, uh, crucially important uh, for, for a good outcome. Anyway, I'll leave it there and uh, thanks for the opportunity. If you allow me to say something on the last one, I, th I think it's something we definitely need to, to touch. Probably we'll touch on this tomorrow and eh, we will discuss a bit uh, what are the actions we need to, to undertake in order to, uh, to, to, to raise, to revive, let's say, the, the Geo Wetlands uh, initiative. But it's clear that the institutional side is as, as important as the technical side. So at the end, whatever solutions uh, we, we, we are offering to the countries and, and, and to other wetland stakeholders needs to be fully integrated into, into their own uh, processes and systems. And sometimes we forget about this. So it's not about uh, only developing technical capacities, but it's also about making sure that whatever solutions, uh, and I, I, I say solutions in the plural, eh? we, we, we are um, offering, let's say, uh, to to the countries that we make sure that these are where, can easily be integrated into their own practices. Thank you, Mark. And I will uh, like to go directly to Stuart, please. Thanks, uh, Laurent. And um, and also Jörka and Mark, um, you, you both raised some really valuable points and I'd just like to build on a couple of those. Um, and this kind of tallies, I think, with what Lisa um, had mentioned earlier in her presentation at the beginning, and also Maria. Um, I, I think to just to begin with, I would just like to try and hover up a little bit from this kind of technical element that's going on on the screen into a, into a sort of um, into some of the points that sort of Jerka has, has alluded to there and Mark also. So I think the first point I'd like to make is that um, we we really need to understand correctly that there are these global policy frameworks that are in place. And those policy frameworks are the, both the sort of the, the, the means by which any wetlands work should operate through to ensure sustainability so that it's directed out to the countries. Um, and, and you've mentioned a few already, and I'd just like to sort of see where, uh, share, share where I see my priorities. That's the, the Ramsar Convention. Uh, on wetlands, it's the SDGs, um, it's the Global Biodiversity Framework, and it's the it's the nationally determined contributions. Essentially, that what Jörka was mentioning around the greenhouse gas fluxes and where we need to prioritize carbon accounting. But those are four global frameworks that exist, and and I it's my view that the, that they should be given priority because they are the gateway to our clients, and our clients are countries. And ultimately, that is where we will see sustainability through any, any work that is generated through this initiative. So I, I think it's really important you, that you see that, that sort of high level 
um, uh, policy mandate uh, to begin with. The, the second there, and this is also mentioned, I think, in, in Lisa Rebella's uh, presentation at the beginning, is about audience, is about making these things fit for purpose. And I believe she used the term uh, end user. And I think we, this discussion here, really, we really need to figure out using those global policy frameworks, who the audience is within those global policy frameworks. And, and that will really help us shape what kind of products uh, can be generated to fit those frameworks and, and, and end up in the hands of users. Because what um, I would be concerned about is that you have lots of different types of products that aren't necessarily aligned with each other. So, so my first point is on frameworks. My second is making sure we actually have the right audience in this discussion. And Mark, you mentioned before that I, I think we should have um, within this initiative um, somebody from, from the CBD Secretariat at least. Um, and, and I think also, you know, bearing in mind the, the value of wetlands in terms of holding carbon in the ground, um, we need to think very seriously about having colleagues from either you know, the Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, so so that, that, those audiences aren't there yet, but they, they should be part of this. And that will help us identify the needs, um, it's, it, it, it's my view. Following that process, I, I would then work on to the, the sort of product development. And, and here at that point, I would like to say, you know, there are certain products that are already out there. And we've seen a lot of very interesting presentations this morning, very much focused on sort of national level um, piloting initiatives, and that's super. Um, I think there's an enormous amount that we can learn from that research and development and piloting process. Um, but really, if we're looking for sort of long-term sustainability in this work, um, with that product development needs to make sure that there is alignment between those policy frameworks that I mentioned before. Some of that work is already out there and published. Some of it is, is um, on the horizon right now. So that alignment, alignment I would see is, is two, two sort of strands to it. One is making sure that there's a data alignment so that there's an interoperability between the data that is being used between those policy frameworks and the platform alignment. So, you know, whether you are, um, uh, a focal point from Ramsar in a country interested in completing a, a national inventory, or your uh, SDG 661 indicator, technical focal point indicated in monitoring and reporting, that data use is interchangeable. And I think that's what we really need to be striving for here is a level of alignment between our data and our platforms. The last point I mentioned, and I realize I'm taking a bit of time here, is around imp tracking implementation. There is a risk that we are not, um, that we're just pushing out data. And um, there is a, an expression in English where we, which says that you can, you know, lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And we can put all the best data out there in the world, but unless it's being used, it's redundant. So we have to make this sort of data or, or the work that we do, we have to track its implementation. And I really believe we need to move or at least see the spectrum of moving from monitoring into data to policy and data uptake. And, and I think the work that we're trying to, what's being discussed here under this initiative needs to also have that within its implementation plan. And so tracking implementation and identifying what those indicators of success would look like in terms of tracking implementation and uptake and application of the data is a really important end goal. So it's not just putting it out there, but, but making sure that uh, it's used. Um, so those are kind of the higher level points that I, I would just like to convey that um, I think I'd like to try to see formulate within this implementation plan for all that uh, you mentioned at the start. Thanks. Thank you very much, Stuart. And uh, I, I, we really understand your point. As you can see with this new platform, we have a very dynamic and active community. So the question is how we can on, on keep it, this community alive, connected to actually this high level issues and how can we bring you know not only data but all the science and and that can help you to actually maintain or long to have long term sustainable monitoring uh, of, of 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 wetlands so i think it's it's all these questions here that we have to this workshop for us really to, to coordinate and i see eleni that raised her hand for a long time now so i would like to give you the floor please eleni Hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for this uh, very interesting initiative. It 
was quite a long time that we had to discuss for wetlands. Uh, as you know, we have uh, recently did the uh, wetland mapping and assessment in the Balkan Mediterranean wetlands. So I would like to talk uh, about this uh, experience with a major comment uh, that uh, could be added in the discussions already uh, held. Uh, so uh, the, the word and the topic that uh, I, I see that uh, there is a gap on that, it is the governance, the wetlands governance. Uh, I see it in my country and uh, I know that uh, the same condition uh, uh, more or less uh, occurs in uh, Mediterranean that uh, uh, usually amongst the ministries, amongst the services that uh, have some competencies on wetlands, there is uh, uh, no uh, well-defined uh, uh, road uh, of uh, how to uh, make uh, actions for protection or restoration or conservation. And this is the case, these governance gaps uh, mainly uh, is the case when we are talking about small wetlands and uh, if we have uh, an earth observation system uh, you know uh, very well that uh, uh, the main success uh, of such uh, technology is that we can uh, detect and acquire and monitor uh, small wetlands uh, which are usually are uh, neglected and uh, are not included in, uh, uh, in studies and assessments. Uh, and the problem uh, with the governance gap is the fact that uh, uh, wet, small wetlands are usually outside of uh, protected areas, either national or European or global. global. And there, uh, although scientists or technologists can uh, get, can acquire uh, good data, uh, there is nobody to make use of uh, them. Uh, so uh, my suggestion would be to take into consideration in uh, the geo wetland work, uh, the governance gaps uh, that need to be uh, further uh, developed and improved in, in the countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eleni. And, and of course, you know, so we organize this workshop in two sessions, two day session. And so tomorrow will be much more about how, so today was really to, to express where we are in terms of what Earth Observation can bring to these issues. And so in terms of product programs and, 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 and research and tomorrow will be much more on how we share access this product change, actually this governance with what we can bring and how we connect. So I think tomorrow really will be the day to discuss this in more detail. Uh, what I see already, because I think if we discuss of that, it means that we, we think we have some something to offer. And I think looking at the very impressive dynamic, look at look at that, that's, that's very nice, that's beautiful. All these colors, all these programs, you will still see some programs that will not have lines because they will participate to this afternoon session because that they, some people are still sleeping at this time and they, are, they will, they will uh, come to us with another time schedule. Um, but yeah, really nice, and and we 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 have to to close this uh, this uh, first uh, morning session of our workshop in in two minutes. And I'd like I'd like to re to respect time, but I would like to say that people can continue uh, uh, to uh, to 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 really uh, uh, contribute to this mirror platform. Also, if you want to put some remarks, some post-it remarks around, feel free. If you have ideas, we can we can uh, also uh, uh, put some more ideas on post-it around. And also, of course, this session was recorded and we will for sure uh, build a document uh, from this session and re re remind that one of the, the goal of this workshop is to motivate to have a leadership group and a group of active people 
to discuss this new implementation plan of the 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 uh, this geobat and activity and also to answer to Stuart yes Stuart we actually did uh, discuss with Jean and Campbell we were at the CBD we actually met our Ramsar colleagues at the CBD uh, pre-cop event here in Geneva and we also have our colleagues from disaster risk reduction and climate change we have here different coordinator I'm the SDG coordinator but all the colleagues uh, uh, Rui Kotani and 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 uh, and um, and Sarah Venturini is at our, they are at our leading other engagement priority with our engagement priority uh, chief Stephen Ramage that participated here. We know that we have to connect to these other issues. We didn't want to do everything at the same time. That's why we don't have everyone here. It's just a workshop. And I think the next step for sure will be to open it to more uh, 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 communities. So thanks to our to remind us that we are, we are totally aware of this need. Um, so we, we, we're going to close in a minute. I don't know if Yana wants to say some words and what you think about this first brainstorm uh, initiative. I think we need to discuss much more. This is just the beginning. So I will invite everyone to come either to this afternoon session, if you have time, or to, to tomorrow's session to actually build much more and see how we can go from uh, prototyping, brainstorming to actually delivering something useful. Please, Yana, if you want to say some closing remarks. Um, Laurent, like Mark, I hadn't really planned, but I can certainly reflect that I think this was shaped to be an ideation workshop, so to generate ideas, and I think we're accomplishing that really quite well. So thank you for a very planned agenda, and thanks to everyone for keeping to the time. Doesn't ha happen very often when uh, you plan for so many presentations, but I think we're very much on the right track. Uh, in terms of who else we ought to be connecting, um, and I agree, not necessarily now, but initiatives such as you know, finance for biodiversity with task force for uh, fine, um, biodiversity. What's the TNFD? Anyway, with all these acronyms, you know, you have to like try to remember what they actually stand for. But I think at some point, perhaps um, that's a, another community that we'll need to to connect because I, I completely agree with um, with all the speakers and with Stuart, you know, if if we are to really build this out as in, in terms of what the current situation demands from us, we really need to focus on integrating these various communities to really give this the oomph and the, the potential for that sustainability and sustainment. So thank you very much for, for taking our invitation and hopefully you'll be back tomorrow um, to take us to the finish line. Thank, thank you, you, Yana. Thank you and thanks everyone. Um, I, I would like us to respect the time because we I know everybody has busy days. So I would like to close the, the, this first workshop uh, session now and uh, inviting you again to participate to next sessions. Thanks everyone. Thanks for our Ramsar colleagues. Uh, thanks for the Geo Wetlands uh, folks that uh, made a very nice presentation and um, uh, hope to see you tomorrow. Have a, have a great day or evening uh, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.